Good morning. Um, I received a call from a man earlier this summer who told me about his wife and his wife's sister, how they had not spoken for years since the day their mother died. He told me how their falling out had affected their marriages, their relationships with their siblings, their nieces and nephews, even their grandchildren. He asked what could be done. Before answering his question, I posed one. Is your wife in enough pain to want to do something about it? He said yes. I told him a place to start might be a private meeting, a meeting with no time constraints, no rigid rules or structure, a meeting where silence would be as important as talk, a meeting where pain could be held and honored. A meeting was held two weeks later on a Sunday morning at a secluded park. I'd had private conversations with the two women earlier in the week and knew that one was strong-willed and the other kept grudges and had a long list of grievances. We sat at a picnic table. It was decided that the sister with the grievances would start. She worked her way through four lined pages, item by item. Her sister listened in silence. The time came for questions, explanations, give and take, and apologies. Finally, the sister with the list looked up, almost in bewilderment, and asked, what do I do now? I don't have anything to be angry about anymore. The sisters, in tears, hugged and promised to get together soon. None of us have to look far to see the pain caused and the harm done by an inability to address conflict and a failure to forgive. I know families where the terminal illness of a, par a parent has brought to the surface unresolved issues that will go unresolved unless apology and forgiveness are exchanged. A man I know exchanged harsh words with his brother at a family gathering years ago, and they still do not speak. Not long ago, I facilitated a meeting with two longtime employees of a medical group who had a disagreement in their first year of working together. The initial hurt snowballed until years later, communication became non-existent. At about the same time, I met with two scientists at a research facility. They were assigned to a project that was at a standstill because of a slight a year earlier that had festered and eventually cut off nearly all communication between the two. I see this in victim offender meetings between young people who want forgiveness but who don't know how to ask for it. In schools, I see kids unable to apologize because they have neither the words nor the skills to do so. Last spring, a school social worker called and asked me to meet with two girls who had been in a fight. I've learned over the years that schools oftentimes are ill-equipped to handle student conflicts because they don't have the time to deal with the fragile egos and the aching hearts. I recall early on in my school mediation work observing administrators and social workers tapping a foot or looking at a watch 10 minutes into a session. The demands on their time didn't permit them to sit patiently through the messiness of feelings. When I met with the girls, one Caucasian and the other African American, I couldn't predict an outcome, but I had faith in the process. All such meetings are unique. Everyone at the table brings a history. At the, outside, at the outset, I could only guess at the hurts the girls had endured in their young lives. I positioned the girls across the table from each other, but they refused to make eye contact, and they refused to talk. Thirty minutes went by before we could begin the task of peeling back the onion. Begrudgingly, they offered up facts, little by little. Finally, the white girl admitted that it started when she called the other a whore. Then there was a silence, and we sat. But something had been stirred in the sullen black girl. Her big, brown, beautiful eyes opened wide, and she spoke slowly with an unexpected vulnerability. It wasn't that you called me a hoe. I know you didn't mean it. It's just that you touched me where it really hurts. My mom has called me a hoe for as long as I can remember. Silence again. And then the white girl tearfully offered an apology in the best way she could, saying that she had no idea. I've seen such miracles many times over the years. They are always there if we as peacemakers are patient, if we leave our own agendas at the door of the mediation room. A transformation is possible when grievances are listened to, when we permit ourselves to be changed by what we hear. The process is nothing less than a sacred one. 
Two years ago, I received a call from a corrections official who told me the department had hired a warden whose style didn't fit with the staff. The deputy warden had been passed over for the warden's position, and the two men barely spoke to one another. There were other serious issues within the management team, making it difficult for the prison to function effectively. I arrived at the prison on a Monday and spent two full days mediating conversations between the warden and the deputy warden, chief of security, the manager of prison industries, and the hospital administrator. On the third morning, the entire management team met, seated in a circle of 12 chairs. I opened with an expression of thanks for their willingness to participate in the circle, gave a brief introduction, and then recited a short poem by Hafiz. How do I listen to others? As if everyone were my master, speaking to me his cherished last words. After an explanation of the use of the talking piece, introductions, and preliminary questions, we began to explore the issues and concerns that had brought us together. I posed an, an initial question about the facts. How would you characterize the present situation? They responded in turn while holding the talking piece. We have a splintered team. We are broken. Our team is in turmoil, and I don't know how it should be fixed. We are disconnected. And then the second question, how do you feel about this situation? I do not know how it got to this point. I'm confused and disappointed. I expected more of our team. I feel like I have hit a wall. People were opening up to one another. The third question asked them to explore the pain. How have you been affected physically and emotionally? I'm sick to my stomach. I have difficulty sleeping. They were then asked to take responsibility. How have you contributed to this situation? I've listened to rumors that I should not have. I need to be less rigid and more forgiving. I then asked them to focus on the future. What do you hope will be different as a result of today? I hope we can be a team again. I hope to be able to trust again. Finally, I asked each person to consider what had been learned, that we can sit down together, that everyone here has the same goals. It felt to everyone as though a cloud had lifted. The venting, the expressions of hurt, of pain and confusion, the recognition of mutually felt emotions, the desire of the group to improve as a team, contributed to a connection and a shared hope for continued reparation and healing. I'm often told that a restorative response won't work in a particular case, that the matter is too serious for a mediation or a circle, or that one of the parties is too immature, too afraid, or too angry. My response is almost always the same. The real challenge is in bringing people to the table. Once there, if those in conflict are treated with respect, without judgment, if they are given the time and the space to be heard, the magic will happen. It's easy to talk about the healing that is possible when people come together in the ways I have described. But what if one of the parties is the system, the bureaucracy, the police, the prosecution? when it is the apparatus, as the French philosopher Simone Weil once called it. There is presently in this country a great divide between those who support our traditional justice system and those who are attempting to articulate a different vision. Some say the divide is between those who believe the response to criminal wrongdoing should be punishment and those who believe an accountability model is the proper response. Some believe that crime victims want retribution Others believe that if given the opportunity, victims really want restoration. We are witnesses today to an increasingly punitive approach being taken by the justice system toward our youth and people of color. Formal charges against juveniles have increased dramatically. Blacks in our community are arrested five times as often as whites for marijuana possession, even though blacks and whites use marijuana at the same rate. Black juveniles are moved into the formal justice system more often than whites, even though they comprise only 10% of the juvenile population. But the authorities won't engage with the community. They say there is no problem, that the statistics are false or misleading. They, in effect, say that justice should be of no concern to ministers, their congregations, and the community. So what does a community do when a dialogue cannot be initiated because those in power won't come to the table? How can those within the system be prevailed upon to soften their hearts, 
to recognize that it is in everyone's best interest to reimagine how justice should be administered in this country. The Chinese Book of Wisdom, the I Ching, teaches that the proper response to conflict is disengagement. But in our age of environmental destruction, poverty, hunger, scarcity of resources, terrorism war, and mass incarceration, can we afford to disengage from conflict if to do so means to subordinate ourselves to the apparatus and be trampled underfoot in its service? George Kistiaski, a scientist in the Manhattan Project, who later became an anti-war activist, challenged those who would sit on the sidelines. There simply is not enough time left before the world explodes. Concentrate on organizing with others who are of like mind. There must be a mass movement of peace such as the world has never seen. Michelle Alexander, author of, the new, author of the new Jim Crow, also calls for a mass movement to challenge the new caste system that marginalizes and ensnares millions in our ghettos and in our prisons. She calls for a new generation of activists emboldened by the fierce urgency of now. James Baldwin, in a letter to his nephew, said that we must engage with our brothers, our long lost younger brothers, and help them see themselves as they are so that they cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. I spent this last week in Austin, Texas and had conversations with people at the conservative think tank, Right on Crime, and those at the University of Texas based and liberal Institute for Restorative Justice and Restorative Dialogue. I'm beginning to see that the debate about justice and justice reform is really nonpartisan. It is not one necessarily in which liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans are in conflict. In the past couple of years, I have met traditional Democrats who are more strident in their rhetoric about tough on crime than their conservative Republican counterparts. Where this intransigence comes from, I'm not sure, although I have a theory. But more important than attempting to psychoanalyze those who are in positions of power within our justice systems is to find a way to bridge the divide. The Franciscan priest Richard Rohr, founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, wrote recently about the medieval French philosopher Peter Abelard, who took all of the major theological positions of the scriptures in the church and invited a seek et non, a yes and approach to understanding them. His goal was not to win an argument or to prove that this is the only way you can believe. Abelard simply laid out all the arguments on one side and all the arguments on the other and trusted that truth would lead the authentic believer from there. Father Rohr says that we no longer enjoy that kind of trust, that we have lost the ability to think and dialogue in this way. Rohr goes on to argue that by the time of the Protestant Reformation, the style of conversation inside the Catholic Church was to prove the enemy wrong. He said this form of discourse has held sway for the last 500 years. We certainly know this to be true in Congress these days and in many state houses around the country. It also appears to be true when it comes to the debate over what kind of justice we should have in this country. But does it, does it need to be that way? I received an email recently from a friend recalling an admonition by Martin Luther King Jr. that we should never seek to shame or humiliate an opponent because according to Dr. King, to do so creates an inner violence of the spirit and diminishes the chance to win the opponent to our way of thinking. My friend, a therapist and an expert on indigenous cultures suggested that a restorative justice circle might be in order, that representatives from the community and representatives from the justice system meet with the guidance of a native elder that a sacred talking piece be passed, and that accountability and healing be exchanged. He said that should this happen, the conflict might well be transformed. My friend has me thinking. As much as I believe that restorative justice holds great promise for how we should respond to criminal wrongdoing, I need to temper my own approach. I need to be willing to consider all of the justice philosophies presently articulated, and some that have been lost to antiquity and invite a sick et non, a yes and approach to understanding them. Given my impatience for what I see as the snail's pace of change within our justice systems, this is painful. Ultimately, however, 
it may be the only approach that has a chance of succeeding. So now if you'd stand and join us in singing hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses.